Amen. Take your Bibles, turn to the book of Psalms, chapter 107, Psalm 107. Encourage you to be back tonight, 5 o'clock, the evening service. Still trying to get direction from the Lord. This might be a two-part message. I don't know how far I'm going to get. I got up early this morning, got up here early this morning, and God just kept changing it, and it just kept changing, and that makes me nervous when that happens. Um, I'm okay, it just makes me nervous, because uh, I kind of like to know where I'm going when I get up here, but uh, who knows, this Bible's so alive, yeah. you get to preaching it, and verses start coming to mind, and you get bogged down in the passage you weren't even going to look at, next thing you know, it's lunchtime. So if I don't get finished this morning, we'll just see, but uh, Psalm 107, are you there? For those of you that are visiting, if you hadn't figured out, we don't have a program around here. We don't, we, we don't hardly know when we come in here what, what all we're going to do. We don't have the songs picked out usually in, in advance. Sometimes we do. Sometimes we override. Brother Caleb always has a song. Sometimes I override. Amen. I have veto powers. And just kind of change up. And uh, we just try to follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Are you all okay with that? Amen. Letting God have his will and way. In the this is his house. This is his house. Let him make the, make the, make the, make the call about what goes on here. And uh, this passage of scripture has been on my heart all week. And it started out in one direction and it changed and went in another direction. And, and now it's just all over the place. So uh, it might not be one of those sniper rifle messages. It might just be one of them street sweeper shotgun messages. Amen. Where you just kind of spray it out there and hit everything that moves. Amen. We'll see if the Lord will help us get settled in here and get some direction. Psalm 107, I'm going to let you remain seated. I'm going to read just one verse because we're going to look at a lot of the passage throughout the course of the message. Verse number two, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Amen. That's what's been on my heart all week long. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I want to preach on this this morning. Say something. Say something. Lord, help us, I pray, as we... Take this chapter and other verses. I pray that you put together this message in our hearts and in our minds. The Lord, honestly, no amount of a preparation and studying and, and research, Lord, fully causes me to enter this pulpit, Lord, with the confidence that I can do it without you. I need you. We need you today. And Lord, in, in spite of the outline, in spite of the study, and I pray, Lord, that you would take this passage of Scripture and do in each and every one of our individual hearts what only you can do is our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let me begin by saying that I believe, this is my personal opinion, we live in the most intimidated, most fearful, most non-confrontational generation of Christianity in history. Yes, sir. And the only thing more appalling to me than the uh, fearlessness of the wicked is the fear of the righteous. I'm, I'm simultaneously shocked when I see the brazen boldness of the ungodly, the wicked, the most unbelievable statements, the most abnormal, unnatural, unbiblical, ungodly agendas can be stated with a straight face standing behind a microphone. And the only thing more shocking to me, what the wicked are saying is the fact that so many people that say they're saved are saying nothing in response. I, I, I just, I, I can't, I wait every day for someone to say, all right, I'm going to call you on that. Okay, that's a lie right there. Okay, time out. Let's get the, fact, let's the real, get the real fact checkers out. Let's get the real truth checkers out. And let's just disassemble and shred everything that you just said from that podium or in that interview. But it doesn't seem like it's happening. And it seems like only the wicked and the ungodly, and it seems like only the devil's crowd has a microphone and a megaphone and has a platform, and it seems like God's people have been muzzled. It seems like the devil's put duct tape over the mouths of God's people to the place to where you, it's almost impossible. I didn't say it was impossible, but it's almost impossible to find somebody that's got the guts and the courage to say what needs to be said when nobody else seems to want to say it. Sometimes I say stuff that to me is common sense. That to me, it seems like that's what everybody would think. Only to find out that I'm the only one saying it. Now there's a lot of people that agree. 
I got a lot of secret cheerleaders. I got a lot of closet supporters, but you don't find too many people that'll come stand beside you and say, what he said, that's what I want to say. But the Bible's clear, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Three things I want to show you by way of introduction. First of all, I want you to notice the command in this verse. The command is the very first word in verse number two, let. Now, when we use the word let, it usually means permission. You know, like I let my children stay up till 10 o'clock. Or ladies say, I let my husband go hunting. <laughs> I let. But in the Bible, when you see God say let, it's a command. For example, in Genesis chapter number one, God said, let there be light. It didn't have a choice. God said, let there be light, and there was light. In fact, the word let is used in Genesis one no less than 14 times, and every single time God said, let it, it happened. He created, come on now, he created this whole world. He created the constellations and everything on this planet. He created it with the word let. Let us make man in our image. It wasn't, it wasn't a suggestion, it happened. Amen. And so when we get to our text this morning and it says let the redeemer of the Lord say so, don't think that God's giving you permission to say something. He's telling you to say something. He's commanding us to say something. All throughout the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, the book of Acts, for example, New Testament Christianity was earmarked with a, 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 a group of people that had an irresistible impulse to say something. Right. Over and over again in the book of Acts, I was looking at it this morning, the apostles, the early church, were persecuted, beaten, they were in prison, they were stoned for simply saying something. Right. Right. They had been commissioned by God to go and preach and teach and witness and, and share and disciple, and, and, and that's exactly what they did. It wasn't permission, it was a command. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. It's not an option. You shall be witnesses unto me. Ye shall be witnesses unto me. It's a command. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. In Acts chapter number four, some of the biggest uh, uh, passages of scripture that solidified this statement that I'm making about this irresistible impulse to say something, Acts 4, verse number 17 down through verse number 20, but that it spread no further among the people. Let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth no, to no man in this name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Government officials, come on now, their, their local law authorities were telling them, you cannot speak, you cannot teach in Jesus' name. They said, sorry, but you've been overruled by greater power. We cannot help but speak. We cannot help but tell what we've seen and what we've heard. We can't help it. We need a good dose of the can't help it's today. We need a group of Christians today that are so in love with Jesus and they're so enamored with the power of God and they're so in tune with the things of God that in spite of all the threats and in spite of all the executive orders and in spite of all of the censoring on social media, they can't help but tell what God's doing and share it. They can't help it. Acts chapter number five and verse number 28. They said, did we not straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. That ought to be the mantra for the new, the Christianity for today, 2021. That ought to be what every Christian understands. I still get emails. I still get phone calls. I still get text messages. How am I supposed to honor God and serve God and still give, uh, give uh, Caesar that which is Caesar's? How am I supposed to follow Romans chapter 13 where it talks about those that are in, in, in power and authority? How am I supposed to submit to them and submit to God? How am I supposed to reconcile what I feel like God wants me to do with Romans chapter 13? And I say to them the same thing I say every single time. 
Romans chapter 13 was written by a man that spent much of his life in prison for civil disobedience. I don't know what else you want me to say. There's a time when the civil authorities, there's a time when the legislatures and the Senate and the executive orders and the county councils and the school boards, their words don't matter. You gotta do what God said. They don't want us to say anything, but we, we gotta say something. Somebody's gotta say something. Somebody's gotta say something. Acts 5, verse 40, and to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And they took pictures and photos of their marks and stripes and posted them on Facebook and wrote a book about it. Is that what it says? No. The Bible says, and daily in the temple and in every house, they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. <laughs> they beat them. Don't do it no more. They beat them and let them go. And they walked out the door saying, whoa, it's good to be saved. And the first person they saw, have anybody ever told you about Jesus? Have you heard about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ? Has anybody ever taken a Bible and showed you how you can know for sure you're going to heaven when you die? Hey, they're still bleeding from the stripes. They're still bruised from the beatings. And they kept on saying something. Now, I don't know about you, but that fires me up. Because I don't think any of us in here have been beaten yet. Anybody get beaten this week with rods and whips for being a Christian? Anybody? I hadn't either. Had a few rude comments on Facebook. I just blocked them and keep on rolling. Amen. I love blocking people on, on Facebook. I get the biggest kick out of that. We see the command. It wasn't just the New Testament. Apostles and Christians, it was the Old Testament. Some of the greatest heroes, some of the greatest characters in the Old Testament we know about them because they said something where nobody else would. In fact, I was reading about Enoch this morning in Jude, chapter, uh, chapter uh, Jude's got one chapter, in verse 14 and 15, this is what jumped off the page at me about old Enoch. You know Enoch, don't you, over in the Old Testament? We've got astronauts and the Russians have cosmonauts and Enoch was a was not. For God took him, amen. Here's what it says in Jude. This this. This I loved. I wasn't even looking for it, and it blessed me. Talking about Enoch. In verse 14, Enoch also the seventh from Adam prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with 10,000 of his saints. That was his response. To execute judgment upon all, to convince all that are ungodly. Among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. The sinners are saying something. They're not, they're not, they're not sitting down being quiet. They're not putting, they're not putting the lid on it. Uh-uh. So what was Enoch's response to all the ungodly hard speeches against him? He said something. <laughs> Come on now. Thought about, thought about on uh, Noah. The Bible said in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, he was a preacher of righteousness. Right. Right. Yeah. Thought about Joseph bringing his father the evil report of his brother in Genesis 32, 7. First thing we know about Joseph is that he had the character to say something. Well, that's none of my business. It's funny, people only say that. Come on now. Well, it's none of my business. I ain't never stopped you before. Right. Right. Come on. Yeah. Weigh in on everything else, comment on everything else, give everybody your two cents about everything under the sun. But when it's about something really important, well, it ain't none of my business. Yeah. You can't pull out that none of my business card. Come on now. If it's, about, if it's about the ministry, the cause of Christ, the furtherance of the gospel, if it's defending the faith, earnestly contending for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints, you can't pull out that it's none of my business. Amen. David, in 1 Samuel 17, 26, he said something. He said, what, what should be done to the man that kills this giant and puts an end to this reproach? Nobody else, nobody else seemed to care. Nobody else was concerned. David walked up and said, um, is there not a cause? Yeah. Somebody's got to say something. I, how can y'all stand around for 40 days and listen to this garbage and not say something? 
How can you, how can you listen to this and it not make your blood boil? How can you not be filled with righteous indignation? He said something. Nehemiah in chapter 2 of Nehemiah stood in front of the king. King said, what's wrong with you? Your, your countenance is, is falling. He said, how can, how can I not be? When I heard about the state of, the, of, the, of Jerusalem and the gates and the, and the walls, how can I not be? Somebody's got to do something. What am I saying? I can just give you a list of the long list. So many in the Bible, great men of God, and the first thing we find out about them was that they stepped up and said something. We see the command. Secondly, in the, in the text, we're still an introduction, by the way, we see the crowd. Who's he talking to? Let the redeemed of the Lord. That's God's people. That's the people of God, the children of God. We're called the redeemed. He's the redeemer. We've been redeemed. We talk about and sing about redemption. Amen. Acts 20, 28. Feed the flock of God over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseer. Feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. We've been redeemed. We were in the grips of Satan. We were in, we were in the claws of Satan. We were in, in, uh, in chains and bondage. And he came and purchased us with his own blood. We have been redeemed. He goes on in 1 Corinthians 6, 20, for you're bought with a price. Wherefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit with your gods. 1 Corinthians 7, 23, ye are bought with a price. We've been redeemed. So who's he talking to? He's talking to saved people. He's talking to believers. We see the crowd. That's us. That's you if you're saved. Thirdly, we see the courage. Let the redeemed of the Lord Say so. Say so. Have you been saved? Have you been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ? Do you belong to God? Do you belong to him? Did he love you enough to send his son to die for you? Have you been brought into the family? Have you been birthed into his family? Are you joint heirs with Jesus Christ? Is he making you a mansion in heaven? Has he given you eternal life? Has he forgiven you of all your sins? Then say something. Say something. If you're numbered with the redeemed, you should say something. God's people... They've always been a vocal people. They've always been known for saying something when nobody else would. Not until recently have I noticed, and I'm sure it's been just incrementally getting worse, but lately it's shocking. It's shocking. And I'm not even really right now as much fussing to the, about the people of God and the church members as I am so-called preachers. I said so-called. I'm not sure they've ever been God called. Because right. when God calls somebody, he enables them. Right. When God puts his hand on a man, he gives him an unction and he gives him a spirit and he gives him the power and he gives him the courage to do what needs to be done and said what needs, needs to be said. But well, we got preachers today that's tight-lipped. Right. They won't say anything. When they do say something, it's stupid. Amen. When they do say something that you wish they hadn't, they're going along with the world's agenda and going along with the political agenda and going along with the, with the things of the world and they don't, they're not known for saying anything that's contrary to the world. God didn't say, let the redeemed of the Lord think so. He didn't say, let the redeemed of the Lord believe so. He didn't say, let the redeemed of the Lord feel so or know so or enjoy so. He said, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. People shouldn't have to guess where you stand. I know some Baptists said to be great poker players. Their facial expression never changes. I don't know if they've got an immense amount of self-control, if they're just numb, or if they're deaf, or if they're dead, if they've even got a pulse. People get tickled to me up here on the platform. I preacher, I love watching you and that choir singing. It's like, well, I don't like watching some of you in the choir singing. You don't realize that's the best choir in the country. That youth choir, I almost got them up here this morning. They're going to sing tonight. Isaiah, get them ready tonight. Maybe sing out when y'all sung Wednesday night. Maybe sing out one again. I like that one, that first one. You know what I'm talking about? I don't, but I liked it. <laughs> I liked it. Them kids up here. The kids up here singing. The only reason why I didn't get them to sing this morning is half of them's over there in junior church. You got, I'm telling you, we got, we got a youth choir second to none right. Right. up here. And sometimes I look out at people's faces and there's, 
It's like you're watching the credits at the end of a black and white silent movie. You just... I'm telling you, man, when they get to singing, I feel something stirring on the inside. I feel something bubbling on the inside. I get, I get, I, I can't help it. Can't help it. Let the redeemed say so. Are y'all, can y'all handle a point or two of this or do we need to throw a time out? I, I was reading this chapter, chapter 107. There's so many things in here. I tried to just break it down into some, some points. But he's, he's scattered. He keeps repeating himself. He keeps saying the same thing, and then he says something different. Then he says something he's already said, and I was trying to put it all together in an outline, and I, don't, I changed it four or five times. I probably ought to just throw the outline in the trash and just preach it. But let me just see if I can give you three points this morning. If you'll help me to listen, I want you to pass your scripture to speak to you like it spoke to me. Number one, when it comes to saying something, we ought to say something by protesting. I'm amazed at, the, at how bad it has gotten in our generation, in our day, and I still have yet to hear so many so-called Christians even grunt in protest. Right, right, right. Amen. You're right. You're right. Amen. This chapter is filled with many horrible, unpleasant situations that the people of God found themselves in because of their own sin, their own disobedience. God let them go through affliction and judgment. God let them go through difficult times, the trials and the afflictions and the horrible situations that the redeemed found themselves in in this chapter are numerous. However, they did not enjoy it. They didn't want it, they didn't like it. That was the one thing that kept jumping off the page at me after I read this chapter, I don't know how many times I read it, I had to come to the conclusion that when it got bad, they got uncomfortable. And yet we live in a society today where it's bad. I mean, it's horrible. And yet you don't really hear much protest. You don't see too many of God's people squirming. It's almost like the illustration where you put the frog in the water and turn the heat up. And that frog is boiling and don't even know it. It has gotten incrementally worse, progressively worse and worse and worse. And we still have people today going, I don't know why they're trying to do that. They've been trying to do that for 40 years. I don't know why these school boards are putting this pornography in, 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 the, in the library. It's been in there for years. I don't know why they're trying to teach all this Marxism to our young people. They've been teaching Marxism for years. No, well, while the churches are not taking a stand, they quit standing years ago. Years ago. I mean, it's, it's hard for me. It's hard for me to keep a straight face when I'm talking to some people. They act like this is all something new. Man, I just tell you, the media has gotten so bad. The media has gotten so The media has always been bad. I remember when Ronald Reagan was president back in 1980, he had to deal with Sam Donaldson. That was the Jim Acosta of the the 80s. Sam Donaldson standing up asking stupid questions. Just communistic, socialistic, Marxist questions. Is everybody okay? Please tell me I don't have any Jim Acosta fans in here this morning. And if you don't know who I'm talking about, praise the Lord, that's even better. The media's always had an agenda. The media's always been anti-America, anti-patriotic, anti-constitution, anti-God, anti-church. This is nothing new. They've always had a corrupt agenda. I just don't understand. You can't can't hardly watch the news anymore. I quit watching it years ago. Unless you just like being lied to. You like being manipulated. I was calling CNN, the Communist News Network, 30 years ago. When I used to live in Atlanta, and I would drive right by it every single week, I'd look over there at at, at Ted Turner, who married Hanoi Jane, by the way, Jane Fonda, who went to Vietnam and stood with the North Vietnamese against America. That's Ted Turner's wife. He owns 90% of the channels on your cable television. Don't act shocked when they're anti-America and anti-God. It's not new. I'm trying to preach and y'all are distracting me. Quit. Just like the water's been turned up. Man, I tell you, it's getting bad in Washington. It's been bad in Washington. It's been bad. And yet we've got people today that still won't say anything. 
There came a point in time in this chapter when they lifted up their voices and protested because they were in trouble. We see that word over and over and over in this chapter. They were in trouble. Can I tell you something this morning? We're in trouble. Our country's in trouble. Our world's in trouble. Our political system's in trouble. Our public schools are in trouble. Our churches are in trouble. God's people are in trouble. You say something by protesting. Partial list of the situation the people of God found themselves in. In verse number five, they were protesting because of the famine. Because of the famine. Hungry and thirsty. They wandered in the wilderness in a solitary way and found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. They lifted up their voices and protested because of the famine. They were hungry. There was a shortage of food and water. Can I get a witness? There's a shortage of food. People right now, Sunday morning, at 10 minutes till 12, there are people right now sitting in so-called churches across this country, and they're going to leave just as thirsty and just as hungry as they were when they walked in the door because they're sitting listening to a false teacher that Peter called a well without water, clouds without rain. Hunger and thirst or famine in this country. They were protesting because of the famine in verse number five. Verse number 10 down through verse number 12, they protested because of their feebleness. The Bible says they were sitting in darkness. They sat in the shadow of death. They were prisoners of their affliction. God had brought down their hearts with labor and they had fallen down. The Bible tells us that they were alone and forsaken and outnumbered and helpless. And guess what they did? They protested. They protested. Look at verse number 17 and 18. They protested because of their foolishness. The Bible says, and I'm just paraphrasing, I'm just hitting the highlights here. They were foolish. The Bible says they were fools because of their transgression, verse 17, because of their iniquities. And they were afflicted. Their soul abhorreth all manner of meats. They were incapable of being satisfied. They drew near to death. The Bible says they drew near to death, drew near under the gates of death. They were confronted with the stench and the atmosphere of death. That's all we hear anymore is death and dying. Death and dying. People are sick and dying and diseased. And the television stations now have a, have a, a, a clock on the right-hand corner keeping track of all the deaths and all the people that are infected and all the people that are diseased. If you still believe those numbers, I got oceanfront property in Wyoming I want to sell you. But we're confronted with it. I'm talking about the death. They're sitting in it. They're, they're approaching the gate. That's what it's talking about, the, the, the gate, the, the, the death, the draw near to the gates of death. They were protesting the famine. They were protesting their feebleness. They were protesting their foolishness. They were protesting their fear, verse 25 and 26 and 27. He commandeth and raised the stormy wind, which lifted up the waves thereof. They mounted up to the heaven. They go down again to the depths. Their, souls and it, their soul is melted because of trouble. They were just absolutely paralyzed with fear. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at their wits end. And every one of these four passages of Scripture that I just highlighted ends with verse number 6, verse 13, verse 19, and verse number 28. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble. They protested. The circumstances they found themselves in, they were disheartened, they were troubled, and yet we live in a day where people are just as calm as a cucumber about stuff that's actually, war, wars have been started over less. Right, right. Yes, sir. Presidents have been impeached yes. for less. I'm, I'm walking the tightrope up here. I don't like getting political in the pulpit. But this deep state that's running this president, the whole crowd needs to be lined up in a firing squad. They're all tra traitors, treason. What they did in Afghanistan is treason. Every single one of them. Every single one of them. You know it and I know it and I ain't scared to say something. Traitors, Amen. violating their oath, the Constitution, and shooting missiles and killing little children. 
the media won't say nothing, all the powers that be won't say nothing, and all the four and five star generals that pull the trigger, they're a bunch of lying devils, and I'm telling you this morning, we live in a day and age where somebody ought to protest. But it's like, oh well, another day in the neighborhood. I know you're with me. Most Christians today, their mantra is, I'm rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. They refuse to acknowledge their foolish ways. They're unaffected by the famine. They're content to go to bed hungry. These people say, I, I, that church I go to, that preacher don't preach. I've been going to that church, he won't preach. I'm like, why are you still going there? Why are you still going there? Ain't nobody get a gun to your head and make you get up in the morning and go to that dead church and listen to that false teacher. Nobody's making you do that. Why are you still going there? Well, I go because my grandpa, he's buried out back. Dig him up and take him with you. Life's too short to go to a dead church. Listen to false doctrine and false teaching where the Spirit of God can't work and everything is just completely cramped and the Holy Spirit's grieved. People are okay going to bed hungry. I'm shocked at how many people go home from church on Sunday, from their church, and then they come and watch our church on Facebook. Every service, not just the preaching, the song service, everything, they watch it. That blows my mind. That's like, that's like eating and then going somewhere to eat. Number two, I'm trying to hurry. Say something by protesting. Number two, let the redeemed the Lord say something by praying. This is, I'm, trying, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to bring this down, bring this plane in for a landing here. But verse number six is a prayer. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble. Do you see that? Verse number 13, then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble. Verse 19, then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble. Verse 28, then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble over and over and over again. These people, when it got bad, their back was against the wall and they were confronted with famine and feebleness and their foolishness and they were confronted with all this fear. You know what they did? They did what God's people are supposed to do. They turned to God in prayer. Let me ask you, was the last time you said something in your prayer closet? Somebody sent me something this past week and I thought, how true it is. Our gun safes are full, but our prayer closets are empty. Need to go buy some more ammo. Need to go buy another gun. No, you need to go pray is what you need to do. How much time did you spend this week praying about how bad it is? Watching all these videos, forwarding all this stuff. Oh, you got to see this video. You got to hear what this person says. You got you to watch this. You got to watch it. Why don't you pray? Say something to God in the prayer closet. Come on now. Y'all ain't gonna die on me, are you, on a Sunday morning preaching on prayer? Because every single time without fail, verse six, verse 13, verse 19, and verse 28, every single time that they turned to God in prayer, he delivered them every single time. You want deliverance? Joining a militia is probably not gonna fix that. Hmm? Buying a few more flags and hanging them on your front porch probably is not gonna fix it getting you a couple more patriotic punchline bumper stickers and putting them on the back of your ride is probably not going to fix it. Getting you a, come on now, buying you a really cool t-shirt and a hoodie or a ball cap with an American flag on it is probably not going to fix it. I tell you what might fix it is getting the Holy God in the prayer closet and going to God and say something to God in prayer. That might be what God's waiting on if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. But see, we want God to do all the healing and we want God to change our country, but we're not willing to pray and we're not willing to turn from our wicked ways and seek his face. We're waiting on God and God's waiting on us. Let the redeemer of the Lord say so. Are you a child of God? Talk to him. He's your father. Go to him. God's people ought to be praying people. Are you praying yet? Are you praying yet? I preached a message a year or two ago out of Jonah. Remember that? Jonah chapter number one, he disobeyed, ran from God, went to sleep, storm came, blah, blah, blah. Lost his testimony. They threw him overboard. Storm was calm. The great, well, great, the great fish ate him, ate him, swallowed him. I don't believe that. 
I don't believe great fish swallow Jonah. Well, I'm a Bible believer. And if the Bible said Jonah swallowed the great fish, I'd believe that. But you get to Jonah chapter number two. This is from memory. I think I'm right on this. Verse one, then, then Jonah prayed. In chapter one, the mariners were praying. In chapter one, the heathen mariners woke him up and begged him to pray to his God, and we have no record he ever did. Come on now. The only one on the ship that's got a God with ears that can hear and hands that can touch and a voice that can do something and power to change things. The only one in Jonah 1 doesn't pray. The rest of them's praying. Brother Adrian was telling me, he was at the park the other day, seeing a Muslim gentleman come over there and roll out his prayer mat in the park, public park, and get down, start facing Mecca and praying. Brother Adrian went over there and handed him a gospel tract, invited him to church. Oh, I don't believe Muslims can get saved. Well, you don't believe the Bible. I had the privilege of sitting with a dear sister. Can I tell them? Can I tell them? Now, don't, y'all leave her alone. Don't mess with her after church. Now, you're going to have to crawl over me. She used to be a Muslim. She got saved. Now she's a Christian. Amen. Don't tell me they can't get saved. Don't tell me they can't get saved. I can't believe you're saying that right here after the 20th anniversary of 9-11. They are lost and going to hell and they need to be saved. Right. Amen. 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 They're just as lost as a lot of Baptists. Right. Come on now. Y'all made me forget where I was at. Praying. Oh, Jonah. It's not in my notes. It's just coming at me. Jonah. Everybody in chapter one's praying except the only one in there that can, that's got a God that can hear that's a prayer. Right. Wake up, pray, pray, lest we all perish. Oh, what's the problem, boys? We're about to die. Oh, yeah, that, that would be my fault. <laughs> Cast lots. What did you do? Well, you know, the only one true God called me to the mission field and I didn't want to go. That's why all this is happening. If y'all just throw me over, overboard, it'll all quit. They said, no, we don't, want, we, don't, we, don't, we don't want to do that. I think right there, if I'd have been Jonah, I might would have prayed that the storm died down. I'm just saying. Let's give this another shot. And they rode and they fought and they fought and they couldn't do it. And finally they said, oh, we hate to do this, but we're going to toss you overboard. He said, toss me overboard. Threw him overboard. He gets swallowed by a fish. Jonah chapter 2, verse 1. Then Jonah prayed. You know what? We just came through 2020, the craziest year. If you used to read science fiction books and watch science fiction movies, they're yet to make a movie as crazy as 2020 was. And it's just getting crazier. And I just want off this bus so bad. But I don't see a bus stop anywhere on this route. And yet we've got so-called Christians today that say they've been redeemed, they still don't have a prayer life worth the flip. I, oh, I know I'm right. I know I'm right. Because when you get to preaching on prayer, it gets quiet when you're talking to people that don't pray. Go, mm, that hurt. Mm, ouch. Mm. Preacher, you got time to hit that third point. Go ahead and move to that third point. We got the point. Go ahead and the point number three. You got room on that screen for one more point. Moving on, moving on. Hey, let the redeemed the Lord say so in their prayer closet. Pray. That's what they did in this chapter. They went to God. They cried out to God in their trouble, and he, every single time, delivered them. We don't want to be delivered, apparently, because we're not crying out to God yet. We'd have more people show up. We'd have more people show up tomorrow night at seven o'clock to divide up into teams and smell armpits than we would to pray if we called a prayer meeting tomorrow night. We could say we're going to sniff armpits tomorrow night, break up in teams. We'd have more people show up tomorrow night than we would if we said we're going to have prayer meeting. 
You know I'm telling the truth. Some of y'all just laughed for the first time in two months. Let me close with this. I can't hardly see that clock in the back. There's a glare. I can't see it. Don't worry about it. Number three, write this down. Say something by praising. Amen. By praising. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to, this is what I wanted to get to. This is the fun part. We had to get through all that rough part to get to this fun part. It starts out in verse one. Give thanks unto the Lord. Praise good. You see that? Ain't God good. Who are you talking about how bad it is? I'm talking about how bad the world is. I'm talking about how bad the, the heathen are. I'm talking about how bad the politicians are. I'm talking about how bad the media is. I'm talking about how bad Hollywood is. But God, hallelujah, is good all the time. And he's worthy of our praise. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Look at this chapter. Look at this chapter, verse eight. All oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Look at verse 15. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Verse 21. Oh, that men. Why are you preaching? Why are you reading all these verses? Well, he repeated himself. I can too. Yeah. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Verse 31, oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Verse 32, let them exalt him also in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders. Over and over and over again, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. You say, God sure is good. Why don't you tell your face? Come on now. Some of you look like your mother-in-law moved in with you. <laughs> Somebody asked me, said, you know what the definition is of mixed emotions? I said, what? They said, when your mother-in-law backs off a cliff in your new Cadillac. <laughs> it's just a joke, relax. Some of you look like you've been sucking on persimmon juice on the way to church. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Enter into, his, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. He didn't say feel praise. He didn't say think praise. He said say so. Say it. Verbalize it. Let's, let's, let's just take a second and let's have a quick class, a praise class. Say, praise the Lord. Say, praise the Lord. One, two, three. Well, that was pretty good now. I mean, it was, I think about half of y'all was Episcopalian. I'm not sure. <laughs> Let's try that one more time. Praise the Lord. Praise now that's what church ought to sound like. That's what church ought to sound Could you imagine? Could you imagine? Could you imagine going to church just one time where people, I'm talking about the redeemed, said so, said so. They didn't have to be reminded 47 times. Pumping and priming, pour gas on the fire, throw a match on it, that's a dud, throw another match on it. Preachers sweating and slobbering and, and spitting. My heart rate's up to about 200 and some of y'all are just now going, I think I'm supposed to praise the Lord. You think? You think? Praise the Lord. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Praise the Lord. He's worthy of our praise. Amen. He's greater than the world. He's greater than the devil. He's greater than all of our problems. I say give God the glory. Give him the praise. He's worthy of our praise this morning. Amen. Hallelujah. Quit crying the blues. Quit crying the blues and bragging on the devil and praise God for being good to us. Hallelujah. I'm afraid somebody's gonna think I'm a Pentecostal. I doubt that very seriously. <laughs> but I tell you what I'll do, I'll make a deal with you. You just praise the Lord and if somebody says you are, I'll tell them you ain't, all right, is that a deal? <laughs> Preacher, I'm afraid of wildfire. Afraid wildfire's gonna break out. You ain't got to worry about wildfires, Brother Sammy used to say. There's enough old wet blankets laying around to put out any fire to get started. Mm, 
And Jesus said in, Jesus said in Luke 19, they were praising, the disciples were praising. The Bible says that the disciples were praising God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. This was before, this was before, come on, this was before the death, burial, and resurrection. Come on now. If they had a reason to shout, if they had a reason to praise the Lord before the death, burial, and resurrection, how much more did those of us that have a clear understanding of the significance of what happened at Calvary and what happened to us when we got saved and the fact that we cannot lose our salvation and that we are a child of God and he's preparing a mansion for us and we've read the end of the book and we know who wins. If they can praise the Lord, how much more can we praise the Lord today? How much more can we praise the Lord? And the Pharisees came and from among the multitude said, Master, rebuke thy disciples. We don't like them praising God. If you're sitting here this morning, oh, come on now. You say, I don't like this. You just might be a Pharisee then because the Pharisees tried to get the disciples to stop praising. And you know what Jesus said to the Pharisees? Jesus said, I ain't, I'm paraphrasing now. This is the South Georgia paraphrasing of what Jesus said. They said, make them quit. He says, I ain't gonna do it. If they stop praising me, the rocks will cry out. I will get my praise one way or the other. I don't know about you, but I don't want a pile of rocks doing my praising for me. I don't want the gravel praising God when I can do it, hallelujah. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Either praise the Lord or quit breathing, one of the two. Hallelujah. Let the redeemed of the Lord say, say something. Say something. We've got the answer. We've got the answer. All around us, people are so confused and they're so troubled. We've got the answer. Say something. Heads bowed, eyes closed this morning. I wonder, as the musicians are coming, I wonder this morning, as the altars are open, we've got a baptism, so we've got a few minutes for you to do business with God and respond to the message. I wonder, as folks are already making their way down the aisle to kneel at the altar, would there be somebody here today say, hey, Preacher, I need this message? I need this message. I've lost my voice. I've lost my boldness. I've lost my courage. I've allowed the world to shut me up. I needed this message this morning. Would you raise your hand all over the building? Would you raise your hand? Anybody, anywhere? Folks are raising their hand. I needed this message.